Hi everyone. So glad you've been enjoying these videos, or at least I hope you have been. Da he love you, miss you, and can't wait till we be back at your side. Niamh, as always, Uncle D loves you, and can't wait to finally meet you. Your mom's gonna have to bring you up sometime so we can meet. Um, if this is your first time joining or listening to any of my stories, a majority of these videos that I've been posting are of me reading various books and stories for my son who is currently in the hospital awaiting a heart transplant. So, anyway, we are going to be continuing the Tales of King Arthur's Court by James Rorden. Now, I picked this book up a while ago and I can't remember exactly where, but it contains multiple stories all revolving around King Arthur. This book was originally published in 1982, so I'm going to continue on with the story of the round table. I hope you enjoy it. <clears throat> now that Arthur's realm was at peace and free of his enemies, there were many barons who pressed him to take a wife. In all things, Arthur was guided by Merlin's counsel. So one time he asked his friend, My baron, uh, <clears throat> my barons are eager for me to take a wife so that they might have a queen. What is your advice? They are right, said Merlin. A man of your position should not be without a wife, nor should the realm be without a queen. Tell me, is there anyone you love above all others? Yes, said Arthur without a pause. I love my lady Guinevere, daughter of King Leo de Grance of the land of Camelot, he who owns the round table that my father Uther gave him. Guinevere is the fairest, kindest lady of the, in the world. Merlin was evidently troubled, for he could see that this course threatened stormy times ahead. Certainly she is very lovely, he said. Had you not loved her as you do, I would have found you a wife that would love and please you well. Your union with Guinevere may one day bring your downfall and that of Logaris. However, since your heart is set, I shall arrange the marriage. So Merlin went to the King Leo de, Leo de Grance and told him of Arthur's wishes to seek his daughter's hand. This this is the most welcome news I have ever heard, said the king. That so noble and brave a man as King Arthur should wish to wed my daughter pleases me greatly. I shall send him a gift that will please him above all others. The round, the round table given to me by Uther Pendragon. King Leo de Grance entrusted his daughter Guinevere to Merlin and the Round Table too, and they returned by land and water to King Arthur's court at Camelot. Arthur was overjoyed and made arrangements for the wedding to be held at White at Whitsuntide. Meanwhile, much pleased with the Round Table, Arthur bade Merlin choose fifty knights, the worthiest in the realm to take their place at the table. Within a short time, Merlin had gathered a court of 46 men, the bravest and most valiant knights in all the land. At Whitsuntide, the Archbishop of Canterbury journeyed to Camelot to marry King Arthur and the Lady Guinevere in the Church of St. Stephen. The knights cheered as the magnificent ceremony ended with peals of bells ringing out all over Camelot. As they left the church, Arthur asked the archbishop to come with them to, to the court and to bless each seat at the round table. As each place was blessed with due solemnity, a knight took their seat until all the places were filled save four. When all the knights were seated around the table, 
and Arthur and Guinevere had taken their place at the high table, Merlin addressed him thus. Sir, <clears throat> Sir Knights, stand now and bow to your king and queen. As each knight did so, letters of gold mysteriously appeared on his chair, spelling out the name of the knight who pl whose place it was. I shall know, explain the wonders of the round table, said Merlin. At this table, no man can complain that he is at the head or foot, lower or higher than another. Every man is equal. And when a knight is slain in battle, a new knight will take his place and have his name inscribed upon the chair. The name of all knights who sit at King Arthur's table will live forever. But four seats remain unfilled, broke in King Arthur. For whom are they intended? One place is for your recent foe. The bold Sir Pellinoy, who waits outside, replied Merlin. With that, he opened the door for Sir Pellinoy, who knelt before King Arthur, then took seat at the table. Two more are for two of the bravest knights in Logress, who are not yet come, continued Merlin. As for the one remaining, that is a perilous seat. Only on pain of death, Shall that seat be taken by any man, save he for whom it is intended? And he will be the best knight of them all. Merlin looked to stern. Merlin looked so stern that none of the knights, not even Arthur, dare ask Merlin who was the best knight of them all. Then Arthur looked at his knights and sat around the table and said, You must swear that you will never act unfairly. Never in any way be unjust, and always show mercy to those who ask you of it. If you break your vow, you must forfeit your place at the round table. Further knights of my court, you must always be chivalrous to women, rich or poor. Do not do battle without good cause, and never for worldly goods. This was a vow taken by all the knights at, of the round table. And every year they renewed this vow at the High Festival of Whitesuntide. So, the picture is of King Arthur, Lady Guinevere, and the bishop during marriage. And now we'll go ahead and read on to the next story. This one looks like it might be a little short, but it is called The Quest of the White Heart. <clears throat> the celebrations which followed King Arthur's wedding lasted many days with feasts and tournaments. On the last day, Merlin rose to address the assembled knights. Today, he said, uh, so, Today, he said, begins the first of many adventures of the knights of the round table. Be still and watch, for you are about to witness a most strange thing. As they sat in hushed silence, a pure white heart suddenly bounded into the hawk chased by a small white hunting dog. And not far behind, a pack of six black, 60 black hounds in full cry. Round the table ran the deer with the white dog snap, snapping at its heels. All of a sudden, the heart leapt high and, in its panic, knocked over a knight. Sir Bilius, who was... Sir Bilius, who was eating at the side table. Uh, so, I believe the heart that is referring to is maybe an albino deer. Thereupon, the knight sprang up in a fury, 
seized the white dog and strode from the hall, the laughter of the other knights ringing in his ears. Meanwhile, the heart escaped into the forest with the black hound in pursuit. Even as the knights were marveling at this strange event, a lady came riding in seated upon a white horse. She complained bitterly to King Arthur. Sire! <clears throat> Sire! That white hunting dog belongs to me. The knight who rode off with it had no right to take it. Okay, just leave it there. Yeah. Oh, gotta love random interruptions. Yeah. The knight who rode off with it had no right to take it. I command you to fetch him back. Before Arthur could reply, a strange knight in black armor came riding into the hall, seized the lady and slung her kicking and screaming across his horse. Then he swung around and rode off with it, much to the amusement of King Arthur and his knights, who believed these strange happenings were meant for their entertainment. This is no laughing matter, said Merlin sternly. This affair could bring shame on you and be a bad omen for your marriage. <coughs> <clears throat> I shall do whatever you advise, said Arthur patently. Then send young Sir Gowan after the White Heart, Merlin said. Send Sir Tor after the White Hunting Dog and the knight who stole it and send Pelinor after the lady and her abductor. These three knights shall know great deeds before they return, and they will be the wiser for their experience. King Arthur commanded the knights as Merlin advised, and the three knights rose and rode forth to do his bidding. Drink real quick. Mm. So this story was broken down into the three different adventures that the knights had. Sir Gawain's Adventure The youthful Sir Gawain had not gone far into the forest when he came upon two knights on horseback fighting as if to the death. At once, he rode between them and demanded to know the reason for their quarrel. <coughs> Sir, said one, it is quite simple. A white heart came this way just now, and both my brothers and I knew straight away that this was an adventure arranged for King Arthur's wedding. Each of us wanted to catch that deer for the king, but on that we argued as to who was more fit to pursue the heart. Thus, we came for blows. This picture shows a dark knight carrying away the lady. Now, helmet with those wings on him looks nice and fancy, but I think they're just so impractical. Especially from a blacksmith's point of view. Shame on you then, said Sir Gawain. The brothers should fight, that brother should fight brother. Now, do as I tell you, and you will have, or you will have me to reckon with. Go straight to King Arthur, and lay your arms before him. Sir, the elder brother said, we are both too weak from fighting to challenge you, so we shall do as you command. As they departed, Sir Gawain continued his quest. Following the faint echoes of hounds barking, it was not long before he came to a wide river and there caught sight of the heart swimming across. Yet, just as he went to the, into the water, a loud shout halted him. There on the opposite bank stood a fierce knight who cried, Stay where you are, sir! If you cross this river, I shall kill you! 
<웃음> 아, 네. 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 아, 네
Her head will be hung about your neck, and her body placed across your horse's mane. Thus, Sir Gawain rode back to Camelot with his dreadful shame for all to see. When he arrived, he had to tell of his adventure, how he had shown no mercy to the castle, or to the castle lord, and how he had come to slay the lady. King Arthur was greatly displeased. You have dishonored us and must be punished, said Arthur. Swear now on the evangelists that henceforth you will defend every maiden's honor, that you will fight for all damsels in distress, that you will be forever cor courteous, and that you will never again refuse mercy. Swear to keep this oath until the day you die. Sir Gowan hung his head in shame and duly took the oath. Sir Tor's Adventure In the meantime, the second night, Sir Tor rode from the king from King Arthur's court after the knight who had stolen the white hunting dog. As he made his way through the forest, a dwarf suddenly sprang out at him from behind a tree and struck his horse so hard that it reared up in fright. You shall not pass, said the dwarf defiantly. Or... If you do, you will have to joust with the two knights who wait in those tents yonder. Glancing up, Sir Tor saw in a distant glade two white tents with lances stuck in the ground beside them and two shields hanging from a tree alongside. I am in a hurry and have no time to joust, said Sir Tor. You shall not pass, said the dwarf again and gave a loud blast on his horn. At once, a knight emerged from the nearest tent, mounting, uh, mounted his horse and seizing his lance, came galloping down on Sir Tor, but Sir Tor charged too, and when the two clashed, the attacker was knocked off his horse. Sir Tor dealt similarly with the second knight. As they lay on the ground begging for mercy, Sir Tor told them to ride straight to King Arthur's court, and announced that he had sent them. As soon as they were gone, the dwarf fell at Sir Tor's feet, begging forgiveness. Pardon me, sir. I promise never to serve cowardly knights again. Let me be your servant, and I shall lead you to the knight who stole the white hunting dog. <clears throat> Sir Tor readily agreed, and the two rode together through the j green woods until at last, they came in sight of the priority besides, of a priority, priory, besides which stood two pavilions, a white shield above one, a red shield above the other. Sir Tor dismounted, and while the dwarf held his horse, he stepped warily towards the white pavilion, looking inside and saw three maidens sleeping. Without waking them, he crept to the other pavilion, and there found a single maiden in slumber with the white dog at her side. As he went to pick up the dog, however, it began to bark so loudly that it woke up the mistress and her three companions, who all came running to stop Sir Tor. Wait! cried the lady. Why do you take my dog from me? I was instructed by King Arthur to take this dog back to Camelot, Sir Tor replied. Then beware, Sir Knight, the lady warned. You will not travel far before you meet misfortune. Your misdeed will serve you ill. By God's grace, I shall accept what comes, said Sir Tor, mounting his horse and riding off with his servant and the hunting dog. They had not gone far, however, when they heard a loud voice behind them shouting, Errant knight, stop in this instance. Stop this instant. Give back the dog you stole from my lady. Reining in his mount, Sir Tor turned and saw the fierce knight Sir Abelus, bearing down on him. At once he took up his lance and shield and rode to meet his foe. They met with such force that both men were knocked breathless to the ground. They were quickly on their feet, drew their swords as eager as young lions, and struck at each other so ferociously that both shields were soon cut in two. Both helmets were sent flying, and hot blood ran down their faces. They rained blows on each other without cease until even their chainmail was in shreds. Finally, 
Sir Taurus, seeing his opponent weakening, redoubled his efforts and, with one mighty blow, forced Abelis to his knees. Will you yield now? Sir, shouted Sir Tor in tri triumph. Just at that moment, a young lady came riding up as fast as she was able and cried in a, a loud voice to Sir Tor, I crave a favor, good knight. Then ask, dear lady, and I shall surely grant it, replied Sir Tor. Thank you. I would ask you for the head of this false knight, Abelis, for I... For he is the cruelest knight that ever lived. Sir Tor was troubled. I now regret my promise to you, he said. Can this knight not atone for the harm he has done? He must die, she said firmly. He slew my dear brother before my eyes and would not spare him even though I knelt and implored him for mercy. My brother had caused him no ill will, yet he cut his head off. Therefore I command you, as a true knight, to grant me this boon. As the two were conversing, so Belius grew more and more afraid, and now begged for mercy. I would gladly have shown you mercy before, said Sir Tor. Now I must keep my vow to this lady and kill you. At that, Abelus took to his heels and fled into the trees, but Sir Tor took him and cut off his head, presenting it to the lady. I thank you kindly, said the maiden. Now, sir, it is nearly dark. Come and stay the night with come and stay the night with me and my husband. We live not far from here. Sir Tor readily went with her and took lodgings at her house. There was good grass, oats, and bread for his horse and that of his servants, and he went he was treated most hospitably by the host and his lady. Next day, he said his prayers, had a hearty breakfast, and took leave of the good knight and his wife. Thanking them well, he said, this was my first quest of arms, to take back what the false knight Abella stole from King Arthur's court. How glad I am to fulfill my mission successfully. I thank you for your hospitality and bid you farewell. So, Sir Tor departed and arrived in Camelot at noon on the third day bearing with him the head of Sir Abelius as proof of the success of his quest. The white hunting dog ran at his side. He recounted all his adventures to the king and was rewarded with an earldom. Looks like we're getting on to the last story in this one. <coughs> So, Pelinor's Adventure. Now, we come to the adventure of the third knight, Sir Pelinor, father of the brave Sir Tor. He had ridden off in, in search of the lady whom the knight in black had taken away. As Sir Pelinor was riding through the valley, he came upon a fair-haired young maiden by a well tending a, a wounded knight and weeping bitterly. Help me, Sir Knight, for the love of God! she cried. But he was too much in a hurry to stop and help her, and not long after he had passed by, the wounded knight died. The maid, unable to bear her grief, took up his sword and thrust it through her heart. Meanwhile, Sir Pelinor rode on unknowingly through the valley until he saw the lady of his quest, not far distant, and by her, two knights fighting with swords. Riding between them, he parted the two and asked the reason for their battle. Sir Knight, said one of them, I shall tell you, this lady is my cousin, and when I heard her cry that this knight was taking her away, I hurried forth to her assistance. Sir Knight, said the other, I won this lady in fair combat at King Arthur's court, so she is rightly mine. That is untrue, replied Sir Pelinor. You came to court when we were celebrating King Arthur's wedding and bore off this lady before we could stop you. It is my errand to take her back, and you too, as I have promised to King Arthur. If either of you wish to fight for her, you will have to deal with me. Then prepare yourself, said both the, the knights. 
for we claim her for ourselves. Before Sir, Sir Pellinor could move, one of the knights ran his sword through his horse, thus bringing him crashing to the ground. But Pellinor was quick on his feet, sword in hand, furious at the killing of his steed. He gave that knight such a blow that it split his head right off down to the chin. Seeing his former foe's fate, the other knight fell to his knees and begged for mercy. Take my cousin, the Lady Nemu, he cried. I am content that such a noble knight as you will protect her. Pray, see that she comes to no harm. You speak well, said Pellinor. I give my word that I shall protect her, just as you yourself would have done. Should you ever come to court, you will be made most welcome. And mounting the horse of the dead knight, Sir Pellinor departed with the lady, leaving the vanquished knight in the forest glade. On his way back to Camelot, Sir Pellinor passed by the well where he had seen the fair-haired fair maiden and her wounded knight. When he now saw them both lying dead, half devoured by wolves, he wept in shame. Alas, he told Lady Nemu, I might have saved her life. But I would not wait. So much in haste was I to seek you. If you take my advice, the lady said, you will bury this poor knight and take the lady's head to King Arthur. Sir Pellinor did as she instructed, and after burying the knight and saying a prayer for his soul, he continued on his way with Lady Nemu, carrying the head of the lady with golden hair. It grieved him greatly every time he looked upon it. There was something familiar about its looks. By noon they came to Camelot, and all the court rejoiced at it, his safe return, though all drew back in terror at the sight of the maiden's severed head. When Pellinor had told his story and confessed with bowed head how he had head how much he regretted not aiding the fair haired maiden, Merlin rose and said, Yes, Pellinor, you will live to regret your haste. That maiden was your own dear daughter, Elaine. The wounded knight was her betrothed, and a right good knight he was too. He was on his way to court to serve King Arthur when he was struck down by a false cowardly knight. Elaine, overcame by her grief, killed herself with her loved one's sword. All this happened because you will not stop to help her. One day, Pellinor, you will see your best friend, whom you trust above all others, fail. Fail you when you too are in your hour of greatest needs. Let that be your punishment. It, it, it is no more than I deserve, said Sir Pellinor in sorrow. And it was in the troubled times to come that Sir Pellinor was to die in anguish, and as his close friend Sir Gawain stood by unknowing. Thus ended the first adventure, Sir Gawain's quest of, of the White Hart, Sir Tor's quest of the White Hunting Dog, and Sir Pellinor's quest of the Fair Lady Nemue. And here's a picture of uh, Sir Pellinor's daughter along with the knight. Uh, uh, that ends that book for now. Or at least those two stories. I will continue reading more on them in, here in the future. And once again, that was a story from Tales of King Arthur by <clears throat> um, James Royden. I really hope you enjoyed it. Did he? Love you, son. Miss you and can't wait to be back at your side in the hospital. Yeah, more. Thank you. I hope you're being good and not driving your mother crazy. As for anyone else watching, thank you for taking the time and I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you.